An Illustrated Guide to Linda Nochlin's Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists. So, let's see. I'm doing this for my father because it's by Tiernan Morgan and Lauren Purge, and I hope I said it right. Linda Nochlin's Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists is generally considered the first major work of feminist art history. Maura Riley, a curator, writer, and collaborator of Nocklands, described the work as dramatic, a dramatic feminist rallying cry. This canonical essay precipitated a paradigm shift within the discipline of art history, Riley states in her preface to women artist Linda Nocklin Reader. 2015, and as such, her name became inseparable from the phrase feminist art on a global scale. A dryly humor, humored analysis of the values by which artists are historicized and discussed, why have there been no great women artists, posit, posited the first methodological, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, approach for the discipline, that instead of bolstering the reputations of critically neglected or forgotten women artists, the feminist art historian should pick apart, analyze, and question the social and institutional structures that underpin artistic production, the art world, and art history. In her own words, Nachman grew up in a secular, leftist, intellectual Jewish family in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. In 1951, she graduated with a BA in philosophy and a minor in Greek and art history at Vassar College. Vassar is one of the so-called Seven Sisters, a group of historic women's colleges along the northern U.S. It became co-educational in 1969. The good thing about a woman's college was that women had a chance to do everything, Nachlin stated in a 2015 interview with Riley. We were not pushed to the margins because there were no, gen there were no gendered margins. We were all there was. In 1952, Nachlin obtained a master's in English literature at Columbia before undertaking her PhD in art history at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, where she wrote her doctorate on the work of Gustav Corbet. Aside from why have there been no great women artists, Nachlin is perhaps best known for her 1971 book, Realism, a landmark study in the 19th century movement. Shortly after she began teaching art history at Vassar, Nachlin had a conversation with an unnamed acquaintance that changed her life. She recalls the exchange in her 1994 essay, Starting from Scratch. Have you heard about women's liberation, she asked me. I already was, I said, a liberated woman, and I knew enough about feminism, suffragettes and such, to realize that we in 1969 were beyond such things. Read this, she said briskly, and you will change your mind. Nachlin's friend handed her a stack of second wave feminist literature. It included publications such as Red Stockings Newsletter and Every Woman. This was brilliant, furious, polemical stuff written from the guts and the heart. Nachlin wrote, that night, reading until 2 a.m., making discovery after discovery, cartoonish light bul bulbs going off in my head at a frantic pace, my consciousness was indeed raised as it was to be over and over again within the course of the next year or so. Nachlin amended the subject of her upcoming seminar, listed simply as Art 364B, to the image of women in the 19th and 20th centuries. Together with her students, Nachlin combed through the, vis the visual tropes of art history. Among the course's listed subjects were women as angel and devil in 19th century art, pornography and sexual imagery, and the theme of the prostitute. We were doing the spade work of feminist art history, Nachlin recalled, and we knew it. A year later, Nachlin attended a Vassar gra graduation ceremony where Gloria Steinem was the speaker. Steinem was invited by Brenda Fain, a friend of Nachlin's, and the sister of art dealer Richard Fain. I hope I am saying this right. Nachlin later cited her interaction with the art deal as the catalyst for why have there been no great women artists. And this is what she says. It's a quote. Afterwards, Richard turned to me and said, Linda, I would love to show women artists, but I can't find any good ones. Why are there no great women artists? He actually asked me that question. I went home and thought about this issue for days. 
it haunted me. It made me think because, first of all, it implied that there were no great women artists. Second, because it assumed this was a natural condition. It just lit up my mind. It stimulated me to do a great deal of further research in a variety of fields in order to answer the question and its implications. Building up the research she conducted with her students, Nachlin wrote the essay for inclusion in Vivian Gornick and Barbara Moran's Women in Sexist Society, and it's 1971, where it was originally titled Why Are There No Great Women Artists? However, the essay first appeared in the January 1971 edition of Art News, an issue especially, especially dedicated to women's liberation, women artists, and art history. The issue's cover reproduced an 1801 portrait of Marie Josephine Charlotte Duval de Ognes from the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection, which was once thought to have been painted by Jacques-Louis David. The choice of this painting was pertinent not only because it depicted a woman drawing, but because it had recently been attributed to a woman, Constance Marie Charpentier, 1767 to 1849. An Art News editorial note describes the portrait as perhaps the greatest picture ever painted by a woman. Nine years later, the painting was reattributed to another artist, Marie-Denise Villers, 1774-1821. The Met Museum also clarified its stance on the painting subject, retitling the work more cautiously as Young Woman Drawing. The painting's shaky attribution underlines the fact that feminist art history should not be understood as just a necessary corrective, or to use Nocklin's words, as something to be grafted onto a serious established discipline, but as an ongoing project. A feminist art history, as Nocklin views it, would not only entail a more thorough investigation of the painting's providence in history, but would necessitate an investigation into why the painting was misattributed as well as the reasons for its art historical and critical neglect. The women's question, Nochlin argues, can become a catalyst, an intellectual instrument, probing basic and natural assumptions, providing a party, party, par, party paradigma for other kinds of internal questioning, and in tr turn providing links with paradigms established by radical approaches in other fields. The first half of Why Are There No Great Women Artists is devoted to Nochlin's methodological methodo, metho, here we go again, thesis, anyhow. She argues that women's liberation has been chiefly emotional, personal, psychological, and subjective centered. But she asserts that in order to be effective, important point, it must also come to grips with the intellectual and ideology ideological basis of various intellectual and scholarly disciplines. In this regard, she refer refers to John Stuart Mill's observation that we tend to accept whatever is commonplace as natural. Uh, here's a quote by him. Everything which is un with oh sorry, everything which is usual appears natural. The subject subjugation subjection of women to men being a universal custom any departure from it quite naturally appears unnatural. John Stuart Mill, The Subjection of Women, 1869. Those who have privileges invariab invariably hold onto them, wrote Nochlin. In reality, the white male position accepted as natural, or the hidden he as the subject of all scholarly pre pre predicates, is a decided advantage rather than merely a hindrance or a subjective distortion. In art history, the white, Western male viewpoint is unconsciously accepted as the viewpoint of the art historian. Nochlin's stated mission is to prove that this perspective is not only object, a, a, objectionable on moral and ethical grounds or because it is elitist, but because it is intellectually inadequate. The question in why are there no great women artists is implicitly ba biased. It insidiously insidi assumes that there aren't any, that unlike men, women aren't capable of achieving artness, artistic greatness. 
The feminist's first reaction is to swallow the bait, wrote Nochlin, that is, to dig up examples of worthy or insufficiently appreciated women artists throughout history. Though Nochlin affirmed that such work is certainly worth the effort, she rejected the approach on the basis that it does nothing to question the assumptions lying behind the question. On the contrary, by attempting to answer it, they tacitly reinforce its negative implications, Nochlin concluded. This passage remains the most controversial section of Nochlin's essay, in part because she went on to curate high-profile exhibitions of work by women artists. For instance, Women Artists 1550-1950 at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, this is 1976, and Global Feminisms at the Brooklyn Museum 2007. As Nochlin surmised in starting from scratch, such, such exhibition work directly contradicted her earlier stance. Well, I said that I thought that simply looking into women artists of the past would not really change our estimation of their value, Nochlin states in her interview with Riley. Nevertheless, I went on to look into some women artists of the past, and I found that my own estimations and values had in fact changed. That this criticism has been leveled at Nochlin is not entirely fair. She clearly didn't denigrate the rehabilitation of neglected artists. Rather, her point was that the approach does nothing to address art history's patriarchal value system. How is art history structured? Huh? Who is asking the questions? How are they framed? And what assumptions do they carry? Why are male artists such as Michelangelo or Picasso typically described as geniuses, while women such as Berthe Morisot or Rosa Bonheur are not? Most importantly, how is art historical value conferred? In what is perhaps the most quoted passage of the essay, essay Nachlin writes, there are no women equivalents for Michelangelo or Rembrandt, Delacroix or Cezanne, Picasso or Matisse, or even in very recent times for de Kooning or Warhol, any more than there are black American equivalents for the same. If there actually were not large numbers of hidden great women artists, or if there really should be different standards for women art as opposed to men's, and one can't have it both ways, then what are feminists fighting for? I mean, if women have in fact achieved the same, same status as men in the arts, then the status quo is fine as it is. But in, actually, in, but, actu but in actuality, as we all know, things are, things as they are, uh, things are as they are and as they have been in the arts as in a hundred other areas are stultifying oppressive and discouraging to all those women among them who did not have the good fortune to be born white, preferably middle class and above all, male. The fault lies not in our stars, our hormones, our menstrual cycles, or our empty internal spaces, but in our institutions and our education. There are a couple of key points to unpack in this passage. The first is that Nochlin is not an essentialist. She does not believe that there is such a thing as an innate feminine style, and this sets her apart from other feminists such as artist Judy, Judy Chicago, who has argued the opposite. Quote, in every instance, women artists and writers should seem to be closer, closer to other artists and writers of their own period and outlook than they are to each other, Nochlin observed. Patterns in subject matter, such as the scenes of motherhood and child rearing depicted by artists such as Be Bert Morisot or Marie Cassatt, can be attributed to sociolo sociological factors, artistic expectations, or personal predi predile predilication, not to, gen not to gender. If women have turned into scenes of turned to scenes of domestic life or of children, so did Jan Steen, Chardin, and Impressionist Renoir and Monet, as well as Morisot and Cassatt. The mere choice of a certain real of subject matter or the restriction to certain subjects 
is not equated with a style, much less with some sort of quintessentially feminine style, Nocklin wrote. Nocklin argued that terms such as great and genius are loaded with unquestioned, often unconscious, meta-historical premises. These premises are then compounded by art history's romantic, elitist, individual glorifying, and monograph producing substructure. She demonstrates this fact by outlining certain patterns in art historical biographies, namely the discovery of certain geniuses. As told by the Renaissance artist and biographer Giorgio Vasari, Giotto's talent was discovered when, was discovered when as a young shepherd boy, he was observed drawing sheep on a stone. Other artists such as Mantegna, eh, Zarbaran, and Goya were all discovered in similar pastoral circumstances, Nachlin jokingly observes. She doesn't dispute the truth of such stories, but notes that they tend to um, reflect and perpetuate the attitudes they subsume. Picasso's completion of all his required art school examinations in a single day is a modern variant of what is effectively the same story, a highly fetishized and mythologized moment of talent and discovery. Nachlin rejects the values of greatness and genius, not only because they are demonstrably gem patriarchal, but because their application typically involves a complete disregard for historical or social, sociological context. Today, the vast majority of contemporary art historians tend to avoid the use of such terminology and consider genius to be a facile concept. However, the notion of the masterful individual continues to retain a powerful allure of oh, a powerful powerful allure over art going our audiences. The romantic, elitist, individual glorifying and monograph producing substructure that Nachlin described remains the stock and trade of the art industry, especially in regards to the marketing of artists and exhibitions. Yep, I can agree to that. This brings us to Nachlin's final field of inquiry, the exclusion of women from art education. Ta -da! Discouraged from the arts, and indeed the majority of intellectual pursuits, talented women have not had their artistic origins or moments of genius documented or discussed. This exclusion, combined with the intellectually impoverished and patriarchal values of genius or greatness, explains why there are no women equivalents for Mike Michelangelo or Rembrandt de la Croix. The playing field and system of values are simply not the same. The latter half of Nachlin's essay examines the institutional ex exclusion and treatment of women artists. Yay! It is divided into four sections. The question of the nude, the lady's accomplishment, successes, and Rosa Bonhul. The first of which focuses on the institu institutionalization of life drawing. From the Renaissance through to the 19th century, the drawing of the nude was considered an essential artistic skill. The exact parameters of this belief changed over time, but by the 18th century it had coalesced into a highly codified and hierarchical structure. Different genres of painting were ranked. Ranking, here we go, history painting, uh, which means historical and mytho mytho mythological scenes, was considered the highest artistic form. It was followed respectively by portraiture, genier, landscape, and still life painting. History painting could not seriously be attempted, listen to this, or lauded unless an artist had demonstrably, demonstrably perfected the male nude. This meant copying from other works, sculptures, and eventually from live models. But it was considered improper for women to attend life drawing classes until the 19th century. Did you know that? When women were eventually admitted, they were usually supervised by men, and their models were often per purposefully and counterproductively draped. As Nachlin surmised, to be deprived of this ultimate stage of training meant, in effect, to be deprived of the possibility of creating major artworks. Ta da Connect the two, please. Nachlin provides a brief history, historic overview of life drawing, while also examining depictions of artistic pe pe pedagogy. 
pedagogy. She notes with a wry sense of humor that Angela Kaufman, 1741-1807, could not be represented in person in John Zofani's 1771-1772 group part trick, The Academy Academicans of the Royal Academy, since the scene depicted depicted includes a nude male model. Instead, she is repre represented in the form of an effigy on the back wall. That's where we get our place. Kaufman was extraordinarily rare, was an extraordinarily rare example of a successful woman artist from the period. In France, the best known women artists were Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Brun, 1755-1842, and Adelaide La Ville Guard, 1749-1803. The two artists were pitted as rivals and were subject to salacious and unfounded rumors regarding their integrity and conduct, particularly Le Brun, whose association with Marie Antoinette made her an active target of pamphleteers and letter writers. Nachlin suggests that the rare and unique successes, in quotes, of artists such as Le Brun and Kaufman were due in part to family ties. They all, almost without exception, were either the daughters of artists' fathers or, generally, generally later in the 19th and 20th centuries, had a close personal connection with a stronger or more dominant male artistic personality, Nachlin wrote. She also observed, but does not delve into, the connection between women artists and the role of benign, if not outright, encouraging fathers. Although this section of the essay is less rigorously argued, Nachlin's theory that familiar familial connections enabled some women to circumnavigate the institutional strictures placed on them is convincing. Aside from Kaufman and Lebrun, she also cites Marietta. Robusti, Artemisia, Artemisia Gentileschi, Lavinia Fontana, and Elizabeth Cheron as examples. As the restriction placed on artistic practice be began to wane over the course of the 19th century, women began to strike out on their own. The glacial breakdown of these strictures was accompanied by the rise in establishment of a particular stereotype, that of the lady painter. In the lady's accomplishment, Nochlin attributes this trope to 19th century etiquette guides and literature. By way of example, she quotes a number of passages from Mrs. Sarah Stick, Stick, Stickney, Ellis's The Family Monitor and Domestic Guide. To be able to do a great many things toler tolerably well is of infinitely more value to a woman than to be able to excel in one. Drawing is, of all other occupations, the one most calculated to keep the mind from brooding upon self and to maintain that general cheerfulness which is part of social and domestic duty, it can also be laid down and resumed as circumstance or inclination may direct, and that without any serious loss. In works such as these, Nochlin argued, the insistence upon a modest, proficient level of amateurism transforms serious commitment into frivolous, self-indulgence, busy work, or occupational therapy. These attitudes perpetuated certain patriarchal advantages. Quote, such an outlook helps guard men from unwanted competition in their serious professional activities and assures them of well-rounded assistance on the home front so that they can have sex and family in addition to the fulfillment of their own specialized talents at the same time. Yay. I want a wife too, said what's her name from that film. Such attitudes persist today, particularly in regards to the tension between family life and work. For instance, the lack of institutional support for both maternity and paternity leave, paternity leave, Okay, for instance, the lack of institutional support for both maternity and paternity leave and the absence of universal child care makes it exceptionally difficult, if not impossible, for many women to resume their professions and creative passions. The choice for women seems always to be marriage or a career, wrote Nochlin, i.e., solitude is the price of success, or sex and companionship can, at the price of professional renunciation. Nochlin's essay ends with an extended profile of Rosa Bonheur, 1822-1899. 
quote, one of the most successful and accomplished women painters of all times, quote. Bonhoeffer specialized in equine and bovine scenes and was awarded numerous accolades, including a first medal at the Paris Salon. Consistent with her methodology mission, I have to get that word, Nachlin is less interested in the specifics of Bonhoeffer's work than she is in analyzing how the artists navigated their artistic and institutional strictures, strictures of her time. Bonhoeffer functions as the ultimate exemplar for Nachlin's essay, as her circumstances chimed with many of the art historian's observations and conclusions about women in the arts. For instance, like Le Brun and Kaufmann, Bonhoeffer was born into an artistic family. Furthermore, her father had been a member of the Saint Simonian community, a political movement dedicated to true equality, whose female mem members made a point of their emancipation by wearing trousers. Quote, my father, where am I? Reiterated to me that women's mission was to el elevate the human race, that she was a messiah of future centuries, Bonhoeffer told an interviewer. It is to his doctrines that I owe the great noble ambition I have conceived for the sex which I proudly affirm to be mine. Bonhoeffer's career coincid coincided with the decline of history painting, history painting and the rise of middle-class patronage. By combining her artistic naturalism with a focused speciality, Bonhoeffer was able to stand out in the nascent art market. As Nachlin surmised, Bonhoeffer's success firmly establishes the role of institutions and institutional change as a necessary if not a sufficient cause of achievement in art. However, despite her enlightened roots, Bonhoeffer continually felt the need to justify her unconventional artistic standing. She maintained that she wore trousers because she needed to sta study animals at fairs. Referring to her shorn head at the age of 16, a look she briefly adopted following her mother's death, Bonhoeffer retorted, who would have taken care of my curls? The expectation to explain away so-called masculine needs and behaviors led Von, he Von Hoor to police herself and her public image. In examining, examining and scrutinizing Von Hoor's attitudes, Nachlin effectively signposted a psychoanalytic approach to art history. In addition to yielding a great deal of information about institutional structures and customs, the study of Bonhoeffer's career also provides a case study of the internalized pressures and contradictory attitudes that women are continually forced to navigate. Perhaps the most extraordinary feature of Nachlin's essay is his presaging, presaging and active encouragement of a multidisciplinary approach to art history. Aside from psychoanalytic analytic inquiries vis-a-vis -vis Bonhoeffer's statements and biography, Nachlin also delved into semantics into semiotics, genius and greatness, and social art history, which is institutions and academic stru structures. Why Have There Been No Great Woman Artist was written during a watershed year for the women's liberation movement. movement. 1970 marked the 50th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. In the same year, both Sisterhood is Powerful, an, an anthology of feminist writings, and German Gre Germaine Greer's The Female Enoch, were published. The Equal Rights Amendment, ERA, passed the U.S. House. The Ad Hoc Woman Artist Committee was founded in New York. And Judy Chicago established the first ever feminist art program in Fresno, Fresno State College, California. And uh, Nachlin later revisited, uh, no, later visited Woman House, a pioneering installation work created by Chicago and Marion Shapiro students at CalArts. The publication of Nachlin's essay in Art News was hugely significant in that it catalyzed the art world to confront the so-called women's issue, as well as the historic and contem contemporaneous treatment of women artists. The immediate reaction to Nachlin's article was decidedly mixed. The January 71 issue of Art News featured a number of responses to Nachman's essay, including a dialogue between artists Elaine de Kooning and Rosalind Drexler, who had markedly different reactions to the essay. When de Kooning possessed that the status quo in the arts is fine as it is, Drexler dissents. This is a part of what she says. What this woman who wrote the article may mean is there are people who manipulate the art world who can decide by t tumbling up business, business 
by talking, by maybe buying articles, by collecting, by publishing, that they can build a reputation. And the people who do this may feem, feel subliminally, no matter what they say, that they wouldn't do this for a woman, or at least not for many women. Later in the exchange, when de Kooning rejects the notion of including women in exhibitions on the basis of some democratic procedure or statistics as ridiculous, Drexler replies that you have to start somewhere. Their conversation, as well as the contributions by artists such as Rosemarie Castor, Marjorie Strider, and Linda ben Benglis, demonstrate that the renewed and growing discourse on structural and systemic discrimination was still very much nascent in the art world, despite the activism of marginalized groups and factions such as the Art Workers Coalition, which is AWC, Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, BECC, and the Ad Hoc Women's Artist Committee. Although Nocklin's essay did not provide a comprehensive or systemic, systematic model for a feminist art history, it did posit a clear methodology approach which she keenly reiterates in her conclusion. And this is a sort of quote. By stressing the institutional rather than the individual, this is a good one, or private preconditions for achievement for or the lack of it in the arts, I have tried to provide a par par paradigm for the investigations of other areas in the field. Three points. I have suggested that it was indeed institutionally made impossible for women to achieve artistic excellence or success on the same footing as men, no matter what the potency of their so-called talent or genius. Yes. As one of the first major works of the field, why have there been no great women artists? inspired countless artists and scholars to embark on their own fields of inquiry. Indeed, the essay is best understood as part of a larger post-structuralist rejection of perceived binary oppositions. Man, women, black, white, heterosexual, homosexual, cisgender, transgender, and the inherently unequal and unjust dichotomies that they perpetuate. Nachlin nailed the problem four decades ago, wrote Eleanor Hartney in a 2015 tribute to the art historian, that her thinking is still so current, says some sad things about contemporary culture. Yes, though its proponents may share the same basic values, not all feminist art historians adhere to the same conclusions or concerns. Feminist art, art history, like feminism itself, is not a monolithic methodology. Opinions <laughs> regarding gender, race, essentialism, and the canon vary greatly throughout the discipline. One of the few maxims generally held to be true is that there is no such thing as a feminist art history. Rather, there are feminist art histories in the, in the plural. Linda Nochlin's Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists stands as one of the first major strides into a rich, ongoing, an utterly essential discipline. Yay, we did it. <laughs>